Esther Gitu Yuat. It's Wednesday, July 6th. This is Africa 54. Sudanese military leader Abdel Fattah al-Burhan fires five civilian members of the Sovereign Council. OPEC's outgoing Secretary General, Mohamed Barkindu, dies at 63. He had been at the helm of OPEC since 2016. And Africa 54 tells you about Oasis Matare, a youth-led organization that allows young people lacking internet access to join educational courses using innovative technology. We begin in East Africa where Sudanese military leader General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan has issued a decree relieving the five civilian members of the Sovereign Council from their duties. Burhan says the army will not participate in internationally led dialogue efforts to break its stalemate with the civilian opposition and urged political and revolutionary groups to start talks aimed at forming a transitional government. The United Nations and the African Union have led mediation efforts to break the deadlock as the economic crisis has worsened, but there has been little sign of progress. For more insight on Sudan's politics, a VOA South Sudan reporter Nabil Biajo joins me live via Skype from Washington. Hello, Nabil. Hello, Esther. Now, the, Al Bruhan has decided to remove the five remaining civilian members of the Sovereign Council. What options are left now for the Sudanese people to form a civilian government? Well, General Abdel Fattah Al Bruhan did not provide an explanation. Uh, of why he decided to relieve the five uh, civilians. We can only speculate by putting it in the context of what happened on Monday uh, when he declared that the army will no longer participate in talks to resolve the crisis in South Sudan, in Sudan rather. Uh, and then uh, civilian factions and parties uh, will, be, will have the freedom to do that and, and forge a, a, a way forward. And now, what, the future, while the future is not clear, what is clear from this move is that General Borhan still uh, yields absolute power. Uh, he, by firing five civilians who sat on the same council as, as he did, as he continues to do, uh, such powers, the Constitution does not uh, uh, give him such powers. Uh, those are powers he usurped when he staged his coup in October uh, 25th, uh, uh, 2021. Do, and, do we, uh -huh, right. Now, Bill, and, well, right. Yes. Do we have a reaction yet from the tripartite uh, mediators, the UN, the uh, African Union, and IGAD, as to how they move on between now this mediation they were carrying on between the generals and the civilian opposition? Yes, we do have reaction from the tripartite mechanism, which, like you mentioned, comprised of the United Nations, the African Union, and EGAT. In a communication they released to some of the participants in the dialogue that has been going on uh, since uh, early on uh, this year, uh, they said uh, the dialogue uh, is now going to change. The framing of it has changed by the withdrawal of the military from the process. It's no longer framed as military civilian talks. Uh, and then the mechanism, the tripartite mechanism, will be engaging uh, the civilian factions uh, in order to achieve uh, consensus, at least among the civilians, on how to move the country forward. Nabil, many thanks. Nabil Biajo is a reporter with VOA South Sudan in Focus program. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed and the military leader of Sudan say they have reached an agreement to peacefully settle all issues following the most recent flare-up connected to a border dispute late last month. Abe met Sudan's military leader General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan in Nairobi on the sidelines of a meeting of the Intergovernmental Authority 
on development and an eight-member regional bloc for the Horn of Africa and neighboring states. In a tweet, Abe said, quote, we both made a commitment for dialogue and peaceful resolution to outstanding issues. Sudan's ruling council later issued a similar statement, adding that the meeting had been fruitful and extremely successful. In West Africa, gunmen attacked in advance as an advanced security convoy for President Muhammadu Buhari as they were preparing for his visit to his home state in the country's northwest, according to a statement from the presidency office. The attackers opened fire on the motorcade from, for, from ambush positions, but were repelled by the military and police accompanying the convoy. Buhari was not in the convoy when gunmen ambushed the vehicles late Tuesday. Two people in the convoy are receiving treatment for minor injuries. Elsewhere in Nigeria, gunmen used explosives to blast into a prison near Abuja late Tuesday, freeing more than 300 inmates. But prison officials say most of the prisoners that escaped have been recaptured. The attackers blasted their way into Oweri prison in Imo State, engaging guards in a firefight before storming the facility. Correctional Services spokesman Abu Bakr Umar says one security official was killed during the assault. Umar says prison officials are still determining how many inmates are still missing. The chief executive of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation says OPEC Secretary General Mohamed Barkindo has died. Rachel Graham has more. The Secretary General of Oil Producers Group OPEC, Mohamed Bakindu, has died aged 63, just weeks before he had been due to step down following six years in the top job at the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. The announcement was made by CEO of Nigerian National Petroleum Corps, Mele Kiare, on Wednesday. Kiare said Bakindu died hours after meeting Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari and giving the main speech at an energy summit in Abuja on Tuesday. The oil and gas industry is under siege. Kiare said the death was a loss to Bakindu's, quote, immediate family, the NNPC, our country Nigeria, the OPEC, and the global energy community. Nigerian Bakindu's career in the oil industry began in the early 1980s. He served in various capacities at the NNPC and represented Nigeria on OPEC's Economic Commission Board. At OPEC, he led the organization through a turbulent oil market period, including steering it toward greater cooperation with non-OPEC oil producers. After leaving OPEC at the end of this month, Bakindu is due to join US think tank, the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, as a distinguished fellow. That was Rachel Graham of Reuters reporting. As Nigerians struggle with the impact of the global COVID pandemic and rising food and fuel prices, presidential candidate Prince Adewole Adebayo tells VOA's Jackson Bungani that Nigerians are looking to change the political status quo and that the February 2023 poll is likely to be one of the most important elections in the country's post-independence political history. Okay, I'm running on the platform of the Social Democratic Party, the SDP. I'm sure you will be, if you have any reference to the SDP at all, it will be in 1993 uh, presidential election won by Chief M.K. Wabiola, which was annulled by the military and led to sanctions against Nigeria until uh, Nigeria got rid of military rule. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Chief M.K. Wabiola died in detention as part of the pro-democracy struggle. So and, um, for 30 years now, uh, we've not had a, an election as good as the one won by the SDP 30 years ago. So what I'm running on is the same platform of uh, fair way to poverty. Unfortunately for the country, the poverty has been gotten worse over three decades now. And now on top of that, we have insecurity. So this time around, we're running on hope again, 2023, a fair way to poverty and insecurity. Okay. But in 1993, it was fair way to poverty. But now it's poverty and, and insecurity. Yes. Okay. It's, why is it been difficult for the successive governments to to get rid of corruption, to fight corruption? Yeah, well, we see Nigeria as a people are uh, synonymous with many good things. Uh, it is the government that has been synonymous with corruption, 
And why they have not been able to change is because they haven't changed. So when you change the government or uh, an administration, you just re recycle the same people. So they will not change their behavior, uh, even though they just reshovel themselves because you have a four-year term, so you need to leave, uh, but a version of you comes back. So what Nigerians are trying to do now is the only way to kick corruption out of the country, uh, because you cannot kick uh, poverty, and you cannot kick insecurity unless you kick corruption. And the way to kick corruption is to kick those who are corrupt out of government. Mm. So that's what we're trying to do in uh, 2023. And how do you convince Nigerians that you're the man for the job, that you're the one who's going to solve the issue of corruption and insecurity in this case, that you will not be the same cookie cutter politician who asks for their votes, take the power, and then forget about them? Uh, they know, about these critical I issues. think they know that already because in all these years, we've not partaken in the corruption of the government. We've not joined them. We've not supported them. We've not been their back carrier. Uh, many of the people you see succeeding them today have been part of the system. We are completely different. We are from the people. Uh, so Nigerians know that. And uh, our messaging is very clear. We know that the problems of Nigeria are human-made problems. Nigeria, ordinarily, the way it's designed, it's not supposed to have any problem. Everything works in the country. Uh, every resource you can use to develop yourself is there. The human capacity is also there. And with all of these opportunities for the country, uh, it's unfortunate that the only malice that the country has is bad governance. So the people know that we, this is the reason why we are running. If we were part of the system, we should have been part of the system uh, all this while. There is nothing wrong in the system from the point of view of those who are inside it. So only those who are outside, like me, that see something wrong in the system. Mm -hmm. And if you see the behavior of the ruling party, the APC, and the, uh, the party they took over from, uh, the SDP, you will, uh, PDP, you will see that even as they are behaving today, they behave as if nothing is wrong. Mm -hmm. The whole world can see that some, Nigeria is going the wrong direction, the country is carrying into a ditch of some sort, but they can see it because that's the only thing they know is um, a politics of doubling your money. So you come into the government, you support someone to come in, and it's now you're part of the gravy uh, train, and you continue to loot the country the more. So it's now the young people, the outsiders, the third force, are coming together to try to push a new narrative, to push an ordinary person I into the government, and we can now, from within, actually throw away uh, the system. If we don't throw away the system, you can give the country a thousand years, nothing is going to change. That was Nigerian presidential candidate Prince Adewole Adebayo speaking with VOS Jackson Bungani. South African mourners gathered in the coastal city of East London on Wednesday to grieve the still mysterious deaths of 21 teenagers in a poorly ventilated turban 10 days ago. Clara Frank has more. Dressed in black, mourners sang and danced to solemn gospel songs in front of 19 of the victims' coffins. All were empty, according to funeral parlor officials, as police were still investigating the deaths. The remaining two were buried separately by their families. Some mourners broke down and wept, while others hung their heads solemnly. President Cyril Ramaphosa was in attendance. The youngest victim was just 13. 17 people died inside the bar, while four died in the hospital. The victims included 13 boys and eight girls. Officials say 31 others were hospitalized with varying symptoms, including backache, chest tightness, vomiting, and headache. The fatalities bore no visible signs of injury. Forensic teams investigating how the youths died have yet to reveal their conclusions. The most likely cause appears to be some kind of chemical or gas leak on the ground floor of the venue, which was packed and had poor ventilation. Another theory authorities are investigating is that they were poisoned by something they ate, drank, or smoked. Some of the survivors admitted to hospital complained of chest pains. Others spoke of trying to leave in panic as people dropped dead around them, but being unable to find an exit. Residents have protested outside the tavern, which they say they have asked authorities to close. Its license was revoked last week. Clara Frank, VOA News, Washington. 
turning to North Africa now, where a Tunisian judge has ordered a freeze on the financial assets of Rachid Ganucci, the former speaker of the country's dissolved parliament and former Prime Minister Hamadi Jebali. The frozen assets list also includes Ganucci's son, Moad Ganucci, and son-in-law, Rafiq Abdesalem, who was a former foreign minister. A Tunisian judge in May also issued a travel ban against Ganucci. Ganucci, 81, is a fierce critic of President Kais Saeed, who last year seized executive powers, fired the government, dissolved the parliament, and started ruling by decree, moves his critics describe as a coup. Southern European states are urging NATO to address threats from North Africa. As Henry Rijo reports, while the war in Ukraine dominates NATO's agenda, Spain wants the alliance to prepare for other potential flashpoints. Hundreds of migrants attempted to breach the border fence from Morocco into the Spanish enclave of Melilla last month. At least 23 people died. The migrants, mostly from sub-Saharan Africa, are desperate to reach Europe. Many arrive by boat on the Spanish Canary Islands, and Spain fears the pressure on its borders could be about to get worse. Ukraine is one of the world's top suppliers of grain. The Russian invasion has cut exports by around two-thirds. The United Nations has warned that will exacerbate an already worsening hunger crisis in Africa. Europe is readying for a spike in migration. We have been looking at whether there is more movement of people linked to the increase in prices, to the difficulty of these countries in accessing grain and wheat. And what we've been told is that, for the moment, there is not, but it is a matter of time. Madrid warns that migration could be used as a pressure tactic by hostile actors. A resurgent Islamist militancy in parts of the Sahel is also driving migrant flows. Europe says Russian mercenaries from the Wagner Group are exacerbating the conflict. It's very clear that the Wagner company is there and that there are foreign troops in several countries uh, of the Sahel and definitely it's not foreign troops what the Sahel needs. What the Sahel needs is development and stability. Spain is seeking international help. In March, it struck a deal with Morocco to secure a clampdown on irregular migration. Critics accuse Madrid of outsourcing migration policy to a country with a history of human rights abuses. The Moroccan government denies those accusations. At last week's NATO summit in Madrid, Spain secured official recognition by the alliance of the threats emanating from North Africa. Una de las, uh, Which is one of the greatest concerns for Europe and for our country. This is because of the instability and the crisis that come from this. Irregular migratory movements, terrorism, food and energy crisis and the climate emergency. Meanwhile, NATO and EU forces held exercises in recent days just off the Spanish and North African coasts. Residents of the Spanish town of Tarifa had a front row view of the drills. It is a very unstable area. It is a ticking time bomb. You know what the Maghreb is. Anything can come of it. A war, conflict. Spain insists it is not calling for any NATO intervention in North Africa, but instead recognition of what it calls hybrid threats. Many NATO members say the lesson from Ukraine is that the alliance needs to be better prepared for future crises. And here in the south of Europe, allies warn that instability in North Africa could be the next big problem. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, Madrid. Still to come, we'll tell you about a Kenyan youth-led organization that allows young people to learn using innovative technology. But first, Heidi Adams has a preview of Wednesday's Straight Talk Africa. On our special edition of Straight Talk Africa. 
South Sudan commemorates 11 years of independence, has the promise of a new dawn for Africa's youngest nation been realized? What does the future hold for the people of South Sudan? We'll bring you in-depth analysis and reporting from the South Sudanese capital, Juba, as we discuss South Sudan, the road to democracy, on the next Straight Talk Africa. In the past decade, has been criticized by Western media for its economic and political involvement in Africa, led by the Belt and Road Initiative. But what's rarely seen in the media is the complex and evolving cultural integration and friction between the two most ancient cultures in the world. On the next edition of Our Voices, we'll discuss the love-hate relationship that's simmering in the community and what we can expect from the next generation. Join the conversation each week right here on Our Voices. In other African news, a roadside explosion on Wednesday has killed Mohamed Ahmed Madobe, a Somali security commander in Afgoye, 30 kilometers west of Mogadishu. Tanzania is pressuring Burundian refugees to return to their homeland. Refugees were given one year to return or face forced repatriation. In Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, Ethiopia rather has begun lifting its fuel subsidy, but 250,000 public transport vehicles will continue to benefit from the subsidies for the next five years. It's time for our tech report, and joining us now is our technology reporter, Paul Diho. Hello, Paul. Hello, Esther. The UNESCO Institute says there are over one million primary school students outside of the classroom in rural Kenyan communities and the crowded urban informal settlements like Mathare. Inspired by his struggles of growing up in Nairobi's Mathare, Douglas Mwangi, a.k.a. the Duke of Mathare, wanted to change that image and founded Oasis Mathare, a youth-led organization that allows young people looking, uh, lacking internet access to join education courses using innovative technology. Welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much, Paul, for having me. You are a rising star in Kenya, uh, one of uh, uh, innovators who's trying to uh, leverage technology and bring about a change in a community that you live in, in a community that you serve. What is it that you've been able to do? The kind of work that I do, I, I work with the Nawas Madare, uh, a youth-led and a grassroots community organization. Uh, as you have rightly said, uh, that leverages on technology to reduce illiteracy and poverty through improving the quality of education and skills training. So what uh, that means to us is that uh, we, using, we are using technology to ensure that, one, kids are able to access uh, quality education using technology, and as well as helping youths who are in Mbatai Salam, who most, most of them, they are unemployed, to use technology to, uh, most importantly, solve a local problem uh, which definitely will lead into them uh, earning a livelihood. How did you end up uh, uh, get, getting involved in uh, tech and trying to support the community that you live in? Uh, very good question. I, I, get, I got involved working with Oas Madare as a result of uh, the personal experience that I got while growing up in Madar Islam. It was very challenging for me growing up in Madar Islam, accessing education. So there are, you know, I spent better part of my days my school is at home as a result of school fees. We live in a really tiny house, a four by four meter shack with no electricity, uh, no learning material. Uh, and those are the kind of challenges that actually kids normally experience today in Matak Islam. I was really um, interested in technology while I was in high school. So I really knew that I wanted to be a tech person. So after high school, I got an opportunity to do some basic digital literacy, which really opened up the, way, the doors for me. I did some uh, web development and uh, design. Technology did not limit me. I was working. The same same opportunity that I got was given the same, same opportunity with people who went to university as degree. We are using technology to ensure that they have a skill uh, to earn a livelihood. What type of programs or skills are you giving these kids? For the youths, uh, youths we are training them on uh, software development, 
development. It's a very intense course uh, that goes up to eight months. So that is uh, targets, uh, targeting youths. And for those between eight years to 18, we are training them on um, robotic, automation, uh, coding. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, this kind of uh, uh, program help kids to develop their critical thinking skills. And uh, the last program targets uh, kids below seven years. That is uh, nearly two years to seven years, but majority are three years to seven years. The selfless work that you do has gotten you uh, some level of recognition. Uh, you've had an opportunity to travel. You met uh, the queen. How did this all come about? That is one of the most uh, experience that I'll never uh, forget in my life. So me meeting her much the queen, uh, it definitely it was a, a testament that whatever we are doing is transforming lives. But I'll definitely, I'll say that uh, I, I was lucky among many because we also have other incredible young people, uh, especially in Mazaslam doing amazing stuff. And that uh, showed, or even it gave a credibility to, uh, to my team because I just happen to be the face of the organization. But of course, I have uh, a very amazing team that I work with who are making things uh, to happen. Yeah, and um, receiving the award, uh, it gave us a lot of credibility to the work that we are doing. Now we're being able to, to, to partner with big organization. Uh, our model is being replicated in other areas. The king gave you a title of a duke. What does that mean? <laughs> and uh, uh, how important is it for the community that uh, you serve, for you to be a duke? I, I did not receive the, um, uh, the title Duke of Madare from Muhammad the Queen. I have received the award. Should we call you Sir Douglas? And there are so many other names that, that popped up. But uh, one that stood out was the uh, Duke of Madari, because I relate more with the Duke of Madari rather, rather than uh, Sa. So that's how the name Duke of Madari came about. Duke Douglas, uh, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. Our uh, pleasure is all mine. Douglas Mwangi is the founder and director of Oasis Mathari. That's today's reporter. Back to you, Esther. Paul, thanks. Be sure to join Paul Deho every Wednesday for his technology report right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. We invite you to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.